here to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Gergi Neu. So Gergi got his PhD only in 2013. Uh, that's very recent for being a speaker in a series like this. He got his PhD from Chapa Shepesvari, who is one of the world's most prolific writers on reinforcement learning. He actually was in the CWI lectures uh, five years ago. Um, I first met Gergi, I think, in uh, 2014 when he was a postdoc in Lille. And uh, I think I know a rising star when I see one. And that was definitely the feeling uh, I had back then. And uh, I'm very happy to see that my uh, prediction uh, has come true. Because in the meantime, uh, Gergi has obtained uh, a Google Faculty Research Award, an ERC starting grant, and the very first highly prestigious Bosch Young AI Research Researcher Award. Uh, he has also received three outstanding reviewer awards for major ML conferences. So Gergi is someone who doesn't just write prolifically, he also reads and he takes the time to read. And in this day and age, if I'm allowed a little rant, that is often a bit lacking, but Gergi really reads a lot of stuff and comments critically and uh, he's a real scholar. Um, he's also been a uh, program chair already of a major uh, machine learning conference, the Algorithmic Learning Theory Conference, at a very young age. Um, and uh, he's also, during his PhD years, he was PhD of the year for three years, but I have no idea what exactly that means. Um, uh, in any case, it's fantastic to see that he does all these things and gets all this credit without jumping on bandwagons or blindly following trends and fashions. He always does his own thing, very much his own thing, and he does it on reinforcement learning, banded learning, expert learning, generalization bounds, optimization, and the like. Uh, he now works at Pompeu Faba University in Barcelona, uh, together with uh, another famous Hungarian mathematical machine learning person, Gabor Lugosi. Uh, and besides all this, he has a life beyond science, uh, so he's a lot of fun to hang out with, I can guarantee. And he also, uh, he actually drums, he plays the drums, and he sometimes makes guest appearances in a, a band with, a, for mathematicians, very interesting name, Bad Axes. So without further ado, here is uh, Gergi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think this should work. Uh... So thanks for the invitation. Thanks for this really wonderful introduction. I don't think that I ever heard anything that was as nice as this. Uh, so I think right now we have to resolve some uncertainties uh, regarding, regarding how the slides are gonna be shared. Uh, there's some intense working, work going on back there. Okay, I'm, I'm sure it's not gonna take a, a lot longer. So maybe, maybe I can say just a few words about what I intend to do in this talk. Uh, today uh, it's going to be a little bit unusual I think. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, one of the most famous uh, frameworks for sequential decision making that's called reinforcement learning and what I'm going to present uh, today is oh there we go uh, well I guess the fonts are not perfect but it's good enough all right <laughs> so thank you very much for that okay so so what I'm what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, this uh, very famous framework of reinforcement learning, which is one of the most successful frameworks for sequential decision making that analyzes many of the breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. It's extremely popular. Many people are getting into it. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to present today is sort of an unusual perspective of reinforcement learning and mark of decision processes. Uh, and well, basically, on the way of presenting. Uh, this formalism that is based on linear programming, I'm going to be criticizing the current state of affairs in the field, and I'm going to provide some alternatives that I hope you're going to find interesting. All right, so this is uh, supposed to be on the menu if uh, this remote thing was uh, working. So the remote, oh, it is, it is reaching. No, I, but... I, I my, so my oh, I see, I see. Okay, okay. So then I'm going to say click when, uh, <laughs> when the time is right. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give a very quick introduction to reinforcement learning and then uh, talk about the formalism underlying it, uh, that, uh, the formalism of mark of decision processes and the traditional way of solving these, uh, solving these uh, processes, finding optimal policies, finding optimal decision making strategies in such processes via the Bauman optimality equations. And then I'm going to be talking about this alternative framework of uh, linear programming, uh, which is something that maybe not many of you are familiar with. 
And then I'm going to talk about uh, a few algorithms that are derived from this perspective. Uh, so next slide, please. All right, so, uh, so reinforcement learning, as I said, is a model for sequential decision-making uh, where a learning agent interacts with, an un with a big and unknown environment, a reactive environment. So this is, uh, this is a sequential process where in each round, the agent observes the state of the environment, xt, and then uh, based on this observation, it is going to make a decision at that is going to be executed in the real world. And as a result of taking this action, the real world is going to change its state, is going to move into state xt plus one, and also the agent is going to earn some reward rt as a result of this action. And then the goal of the agent is to execute a sequence of action that somehow takes the long-term effects of, uh, of, uh, of the actions on the world into account in a way that maximizes reward on the long run. So somehow this is a, this is a very challenging setup because the, learning has, the learner has to reason about the long-term effects of actions while resolving its uncertainty about the world. So on the next uh, slide, I... <laughs> Okay, well, the technology is a bit awkward, but it's all right. So this is this is a so this is a very interesting setup because it uh, it can capture many real world scenarios. You can formulate any sequential decision making problem that can that can be encoded effectively using a reward nicely. So a lot of real world problems can be really formulated in this setup. There are many people that believe uh, that this really does capture all of the interesting real world problems in reality. But on the next slide, I'm going to. Uh, argue that this is actually a very challenging problem as well. Partially because, uh, well, just like the content on the slide, uh, part of the real world is unknown, right? So part of the information is not available for the learner to, <laughs> to reason about. <laughs> and also the actions, as I said, influence the long-term behavior and long-term evolution of the data that the learning agent gets to see and learn about uh, the dynamics of the world. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to contrast here reinforcement learning and supervised learning. And so in, re in supervised learning, which is a classic machine learning setup that all of you are familiar with, I suppose. Uh, so this is based on considering fixed data sets, say images labeled with, uh, with uh, whether or not there's a pedestrian on the image, whether there's a vehicle in the image, uh, and so on. So basically you have a sequence uh, you have, you have a set of data points that are labeled, and the goal is to somehow generalize the labeling that already exists on this data set to data that you have not uh, seen before. So on the next slide, I'm going to uh, say something about, okay. Uh, so you can, oh, all right, there we go. So, so, so this is to be contrasted, the supervised learning setup is to be contrasted with the reinforcement learning setup in which uh, decision-making and predictions uh, happen in a closed loop, right? So here, um, the challenge in the reinforcement learning setup is that all the decisions that are made by the system, all the predictions that are output by the system get to interact in the real world. Like in an autonomous driving scenario, decisions correspond to labeling of the images, whether there's a pedestrian or a vehicle in the image, and then taking an action in response to this. For example, controlling the car, turning left or right, and thus influencing the future evolution of the data as well that you get to experience. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so reinforcement learning really uh, broke through in the last couple of years. It is a principle that has been studied for several decades, but in the 2010s, largely uh, thanks uh, to the work, uh, to the work uh, of uh, a company called DeepMind, it really became a mainstream technology in artificial intelligence. And reinforcement learning algorithms played a key role in uh, in achieving superhuman level of performance in many video games like Atari, StarCraft, in board games like Go, solving problems that were unimaginable before due to reinforcement learning technology. Uh, and it has many, many emerging applications in robotics, uh, in online advertising, in, uh, in autonomous driving and dialogue management. And it really is becoming more and more widespread in modern technology. Uh, uh, but in this talk, uh, what I'm going to do is taking uh, is, is I'm going to try to attempt uh, to not really talk about these breakthrough technologies, but rather go back to the basics and have a little bit of discussion on that and try to like question some of the foundations that these breakthroughs are built on 
try to propose alternatives, try to provide a little bit of a new perspective and uh, make it like a little bit educational for all of you. Uh, all right, so now this clicker works, wonderful, thank you. Uh, okay, so, so let me talk about Markov decision processes, which is really the foundation behind all of reinforcement learning. So Markov, the Markov decision process, uh, I guess it sort of works. All right, so, so Markov decision process is a sequential interaction model that formalizes this interaction that I showed in the previous slide between the learning agent and the environment. This is really the same thing except with boxes this time. So in each round, uh, the learning agent is going to observe uh, the state XT of the environment. It is going to take an action AT and it is going to earn a reward R of XT AT. So the reward is gonna be a function of uh, the, the state and the action that was taken. And also importantly, the environment is going to generate a next state as a function of XT and AT. Uh, so xt plus one is going to be randomly generated according to the fixed transition distribution transition function uh, of, uh, that describes the dynamics of state evolution. So importantly, uh, the past states, states before xt does not, do not influence uh, the distribution of xt plus one, and it's only the xt and at that, uh, that, that has an influence here. And then the goal of the learning agent is to make its decisions in a way that some long-term notion of, uh, of uh, cumulative reward is being maximized. What I'm gonna consider here in this talk uh, is, the, is the discounted return, which is gonna be really just the cumulative sum of rewards uh, with rewards that are further in the future being discounted with, uh, with a factor gamma to the T. Gamma is a number between zero and one. If gamma is small, uh, only the rewards that are early on in the trajectory are taken into account. Uh, and further rewards in the future are weighted down exponentially with this gamma t. Okay, so this is gonna be our performance measure. Uh, okay, so, uh, so Markov decision processes are really wonderful. They have uh, many, many beautiful properties that follow from already these very few that I, that I introduced. So just if you fix these few items uh, uh, in the definition, uh, it already entails uh, the following properties. So the Markov property that I already alluded to that says that XT plus one only depends on XT and AT and the fact that the dynamics is stationary, right? So that the transition uh, uh, dynamics of the world does not change with time. It already follows that, uh, that it's enough to consider stationary policies. It's enough to consider behavior rules that only look at the current state and map it to actions. So for, uh, uh, for a policy to be optimal, you don't need to look at the past. You don't need to remember what came before. You don't need to remember anything uh, before XT. You only have to look at your current state and then you have to produce an action based on this observation only. Probably in a probabilistic fashion as, as, as captured in these this so-called stochastic stationary policies. Uh, maybe can we go back? I guess there's some... Uh, Kind of adaptivity in the in the slides. All right. So so this is so this is this is the class of stationary policies. But there's also like many other beautiful properties that follow from this definition. For example, there exists a deterministic stationary policy that's optimal, and also uh, and also this stationary optimal and this stationary deterministic optimal policy is going to be simultaneously optimal no matter what the distribution of initial states is. All right, so what characterizes optimality or optimal policies in a Markov decision process is, uh, is the so-called Bellman optimality equations, uh, which you don't really need to understand in detail to understand this talk. I'm just going to say that this is the canonical way of solving a Markov decision process and finding an optimal policy. Simply solve this nonlinear system of fixed point equations uh, that uh, express a sort of recurrence, recurrence relationship uh, of this Q star function that is explained on the next slide. So it, ex it uh, expresses a relationship that Q star, which should be thought of as the optimal value of taking action A in state X. So this satisfies this recurrence relationship that Q star equals the immediate reward. So the long-term value of my action is gonna correspond to the immediate reward plus gamma times uh, the, the, the best reward that I can get in the future on expectation according to this transition function. Uh, so what's great about this Q function is that an optimal policy can be extracted once I know the Q function. I can simply look at the, the values of each of the actions uh, in a given state 
and I can just pick the action that promises the highest value in terms of Q. All right. Uh, so it turns out uh, on the next slide, I show that uh, that uh, uh, that you can actually compute these Q functions. You can actually solve this nonlinear system of equations in small Markov decision processes, as long as you have a relatively small, small number of states and actions, and as long as you know uh, the transition function that underlies this expectation by a collection of methods that is known as dynamic programming, which has been uh, introduced uh, by Richard Bellman as early as 1954 in the context of optimal control. Uh, but reinforcement learning faces some challenges uh, that are outlined on the next slide. So the challenges uh, for reinforcement learning uh, are, are really that in, in, in a real world scenario in which we don't know uh, the transition function, we cannot really evaluate this expectation over here. And another challenge is that if we have uh, a huge number of states and actions, then we have simply no hope of finding a function that satisfies all of these equations at the same time. Simply, it is intractable to solve this uh, uh, system of equations numerically. So there's a numerical problem, and there's also a statistical problem of not knowing uh, what P is. And these are the challenges that reinforcement learning uh, has to face, uh, and has to fight. So there have been decades of progress on reinforcement learning that has eventually converged to, uh, to this recipe uh, of concocting reinforcement learning algorithms based on the Bellman equations. So this recipe consists of first considering just a class of, uh, of potential Q functions, so potential function, functions to search through. These are, so we are going to try to find a solution within this family to deal with the intractability issue. And, uh, and then given this family of functions, we are going to try to find a Q function that approximately minimizes uh, the error between the left and right hand side of the Bellman equations. So we're going to reduce this root finding problem to an optimization problem by saying that, okay, I'm going to consider uh, this thing that is called the squared Bellman error, which measures the, uh, the distance between the left and the right hand side of the Bellman equations in terms of an expected squared loss, right? So I'm just going to take this difference, I'm going to square it, and, and I'm going to take an expectation with respect to some joint distribution of states and actions. Okay, and then once these objects are in place, let's just add like a bunch of heuristics on top of this, let's just add a bunch of spices, let's just try to stabilize training optimization tricks, uh, uh, efficiency tricks, uh, all sorts of extra additives uh, should be added on top of this. And then you just run this on your biggest uh, cluster of computers, run it forever, and then report the best results uh, that you get. So this is a great recipe, but I don't really recommend trying it at home, which can have uh, tragic consequences that are shown in the next slide. So if, if you try to cook uh, from this cookbook at home, then uh, you're going to run into dangers and maybe you're not going to be as successful as DeepMind or Google Brain or, or Facebook AI. Because this objective that I'm showing here on the bottom, the, this squared Bellman error objective that is commonly being optimized in this literature, has some very deep fundamental problems. It's a non-convex function because it's a composition of the square and the maximum function. And it's also an, a non-smooth function because it has these nasty kinks in there. It has unbounded gradients. It can misbehave in a variety of ways. Uh, so you don't even need to introduce a neural network here in order to end up with a complicated optimization problem. Uh, and even if you manage to uh, make one step of this, of this iterative procedure uh, work, uh, you can still run into problems. And you're still not even sure if this is ever going to converge anywhere, this whole process altogether. So what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna present today is a framework uh, that, uh, that is an alternative to these Bauman optimality equations. And I'm gonna show how this framework can lead to potentially better algorithms that are more principled and, uh, and hopefully more reliable uh, for the future. Right, so on the next slide, I'm going to explain how to reparameterize uh, uh, our objective function in a way that it becomes a little bit more tractable. All right, so first we just start with this expression, right? So this is, this is our objective function. This is, the, this is the discounted return of a fixed policy pi, right? This is a discounted sum of rewards. So on the next slide, I rewrite it really just by swapping the sum and the expectation, right? So this is simple, follows from linearity of expectation. 
On the next slide, I just write out the expectation is a sum over state action pairs, right? So basically, I'm just going to write this as a weighted sum where each reward entry R of XA is going to receive a weight that is uh, equal to the probability of visiting that state action pair. This is like a very straightforward writing of the expectation. Uh, and then I swap the sums again, right? In order to get this, right? So far, okay, this is not, this is not very illuminating, but if you squint at it, then you're gonna see that this thing, right? I can call it, uh, so this, this is an object of interest by itself. So this is something that I'm going to call the discounted occupancy measure of pi, which really captures the discounted amount that I spend in each part of the state action space, right? So if you look at this, this is really just the discounted sum of probabilities of visiting each state action pair, starting from the initial distribution nu zero. And with this observation, or with this reparametrization, I can notice uh, that, uh, that the discounted return is actually a linear function of this, uh, uh, of this discounted occupancy measure, right? All I, all I have here is really just a sum of state action, uh, uh, a weighted sum of rewards where, with the weights corresponding to this discounted occupancy measure. So I have an example on the next slide that, uh, that shows, uh, well, it's a very simple example of just a two-dimensional state space rectangular, and I'm showing the occupancy measures corresponding to a few randomly selected policies, six policies. The initial state is shown red in each of the in each of these little images, right? And on the on the top uh, on the top floor, we see policies that sort of move a little bit away from the initial state, but not too much. This one goes to the right. This one slightly goes to the left. This one just does not do anything. Uh, on the bottom, there are some policies that go further down. And then what I want to find is the occupancy measure that maximizes sort of the overlap with the reward that I'm trying to maximize, right? So, so on, this, on this heat map, I'm going to try to find an occupancy measure that is going to sort of overlap as much with the reward that I want, right? That spends time in the, in the state space that, uh, in, in, the, in the interesting parts of the state space. So of course, yeah, if I'm given a set of occupancy measures, I can always select what is the best, but what I'm eventually looking for is a procedure that makes this possible systematically, right? I don't wanna be able to just select from a given pool of policies. I wanna be able to find the best policy in all potential policies. How can we do this systematically? So the insight on the next slide is going to uh, make this possible so it turns out that for any policy, this occupancy measure satisfies this uh, recurrence relationship, essentially saying, I have an explanation on the next slide that, uh, that uh, shows that uh, the occupancy on state X, say XT, uh, the, the, the occupancy of state XT equals X should be equal to the occupancy in the, in the initial states, like the initial state distribution, plus gamma times the occupancy measure pushed through the transition function P. Okay, so there's no need to like really understand what this is, what this is capturing. It is essentially a kind of flow constraint, uh, like a discounted version of a flow constraint. Okay, so, uh, so it has been shown as early as in the 1960s by Alan Manner uh, that actually all occupancy measures satisfy this, uh, satisfy this recurrence relationship. So, so far I said that, okay, so, so that mu is a valid occupancy measure if and only if it satisfies this constraint. So all functions, all positive functions that satisfy this recurrence relationship are actually occupancy measures. So this set of constraints uniquely identifies the set of occupancy measures and state action distributions. So this, uh, and this is, this is, these constraints are often called the Bauman flow constraints which is a little bit ironic given that uh, the Bauman equations are, you know, sort of competitors to this approach. And this is like really due to Alan Mann rather. Okay, uh, so with this, uh, we can really formulate our optimization problem as the following linear program, as the following uh, 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 linear optimization problem. We need to maximize a linear objective subject to a set of linear constraints, right? So we need to find a mu uh, in the set of mu's that satisfy these constraints that maximizes this inner product, this expected long-term reward. Okay, so, uh, so the optimal solution is gonna be a mu star. It's gonna be essentially a joint distribution of states and actions. I can extract an optimal decision-making policy from this simply by renormalizing, by marginalizing out uh, 
the state, right? So this pi star, this is the policy that we're going to execute in the real world. Our methodology is going to be solving the LP, right? Finding a mu star and then extracting a policy from that to bring it back to the real world. And also, uh, an interesting fact is that basic solutions of the LP, which are solutions that cannot be produced as linear combinations of other solutions, those are, those are exactly the deterministic policies and the deterministic optimal policies of the MB, MBP. So, uh, so this, this primal LP can be written uh, in an equivalent dual form that acts in the space of uh, value functions. There are the constraints that are not quite visible on this screen. They, pretty much correspond to the Bauman optimality equations. So it turns out that this linear program view that I'm presenting is really just a complementary view of the existing one. And the solution of the optimal, uh, the, the optimal solution of the dual program uh, is actually closely related to the Q function that I was showing before. Okay, so this is, this is extremely useful for somebody with an optimization background like me. Uh, because it really makes it easy to think about the whole optimization process. I only have one numerical objective that I need to optimize. Uh, and, uh, and I don't need to think of fixed point equations. I don't need to think of recursions and contractive operators that underlie the, the traditional uh, reinforcement learning methods and the Bauman optimality equations. So I can really just think of a single numerical objective and trying to find ways of, of optimizing this single uh, number. Uh, but it has some, but it has some problems that are not necessarily so obvious on the first sight. So somehow this framework did not really gain too much traction in the end, for reasons that are relatively mysterious to me. Uh, I think one of the obvious uh, complaints about this formalism is that uh, in order to extract a policy, right, I need to make sure that the denominator is not zero. It's a small remark. Huh? Nice, nice. So some, some people teach it in school. Yeah, the good people teach it in school. In, in the good RL class, in, like in, like in Berts, uh, you get to experience this, but, uh, but this is really not the typical content of a, of a reinforcement learning tutorial. But one limitation is arguably that, uh, that you cannot necessarily actually extract an optimal policy from the solution. So if, uh, so if, uh, if some of the mu's and if some of the mu x's are actually zero, then the denominator in that formula that I showed can turn to be zero. And then I don't really know what action to take. And people thought of this as like a serious limitation because people worried about uh, very general solutions. Yeah, yeah well, okay. Well, I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you why, why this was considered a problem, I think. Uh, so yeah, it, 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 it has some problems uh, due to the fact that people are regarding these LPs at the time. Okay, so, so the history goes back to the 60s and the 70s uh, when this was discovered and the set of solutions was characterized. A bunch of things were already understood about primal and dual solutions. In the 80s, Schweitzer and Seidman, uh, uh, in, in, in a work that, that was, I think, visionary at the time, it really for, uh, foretold the story of reinforcement learning for many years. It was a paper that first proposed the squared Bauman error, uh, interestingly. Uh, but more interestingly for, for, for this talk, this paper uh, proposed to address one problem with the LP that it has many, many optimization variables and it has many, many constraints that somehow need to be made more tractable. What they proposed is to reduce the number of constraints in a principled way and try to understand the quality of the solutions. And this was analyzed later by Defarius and Monroy in 2003, who really made this idea much more well known in modern reinforcement learning and approximate dynamic programming. So basically what they did was look at the approximation proposed by Schweitzer and Seidman, and then, uh, and then sort of like characterize how good of a solution can I expect from this relaxation, given certain things that I can know about the futures. And this has inspired some follow-up work in RL and ADP, uh, ADP being approximate dynamic programming, but, uh, but not quite necessary, uh, not quite enough for a breakthrough. Uh, and I think that this breakthrough did not happen because, uh, because uh, the common theme of all these works, which is again not fully readable on this slide, is that uh, the way that these LPs were interpreted by all these work is that, okay, I have these large LPs, I have these programs, so what I'm going to do is going to take them and I'm going to feed them into my LP solver. I'm going to feed it into a black box. I'm going to unleash the simplex method on this, or I'm going to take my favorite off-the-shelf optimizer and I'm just going to uh, optimize it as good as I can. Uh, Given, given, this, uh, given this capacity and then try to analyze uh, what sort of solution do I get. 
But I think that this is really not the best uh, that we can do. Uh, I think that we can use the LP uh, as more like a spiritual inspiration for deriving our algorithm. So not really solve them as they are, but make, it, make them a central part of our thinking and try to derive our algorithms and methods from this perspective. So what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk uh, is discuss a new breed of algorithms that do this. Part of this is my work, part of this is uh, these others work. And these, uh, uh, these are a departure from the historical application, uh, applications of, of these LPs in a way that they really just draw inspirations from the LP and then they try to turn it into a computational uh, insight or recipe. But yeah, it's going to be more clear when, uh, when, I, when I get into it. All right, so, so the main family of methods that I want to discuss here, because I think that this is really the most exciting and important family of methods, is the so-called family of a relative, entropy relative entropy policy search methods. So these use the LP and the primal LP as a starting point, and it introduces two key ideas uh, to this, uh, which is shown on the next slide. Uh, so it uh, slightly changes this maximization problem, in two ways. First, it is going to add some regularization to the objective to make the objective a little bit uh, easier to optimize. So this, uh, so this uh, KL of mu and mu zero, this should be thought of as a distance function between an, an initial occupancy measure mu zero and mu. So we are going to try to optimize this objective, the linear objective, while trying to stay close to some mu zero initial occupancy measure and also making the objective a little bit less sharp because these linear optimization problems are like very sensitive to perturbations and, and there's very sharp corners of the optimization surface that are difficult to deal with. This scale sort of like smooths those out. Uh, and also uh, it, uh, this method relaxes the constraints uh, by multiplying them with, uh, with some low dimensional matrix as well. Right, so, uh, so this primal formulation turns out uh, to be equivalent to, to a dual formulation. This dual formulation turns the optimization problem into an unconstrained convex optimization problem, which is a very, very useful property. So in the dual, what you can see is that the, uh, this, uh, this reps update or this uh, reps solution uh, can be written as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as these two consecutive steps. First, we need to find a parameter vector theta star, which is a solution of an unconstrained convex optimization problem. You don't need to look at the actual function here. Just believe me that this is convex in the optimization variable and there are no constraints on it. So this is a very nicely behaved optimization problem. And then what we have to do uh, is, is, is just find a, a mu star occupancy measure that is, uh, that is computed as a simple multiplicative update. Uh, sorry, can we go back a little bit? Uh, I guess this is uh, still not perfect. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if, uh, whoops, we are rushing ahead somehow. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. All right, awesome. Okay, so, so, so we need to find a theta star, which is a, an optimal solution of this unconstrained comics optimization problem. Uh, and then we need to use its solution in a multiplicative weight update. We just need to start from mu zero that is shown there times, well, something that has a bunch of stuff in the exponent, right? So this, uh, this update that we're gonna exercise on mu zero is going to be, well, somewhat difficult to calculate. It has a closed form, it's, it's nice, but it, but it cannot be exactly implemented due to the fact that there is this unknown P transition function appearing in the exponent. And for this reason, this mu star is, uh, this, this update is, is, is very, very computationally taxing to exactly evaluate this. We need a perfect model of the environment in order to make this work. And this is not really suitable for reinforcement learning. All right. So, uh, so there's this P appearing in the exponent and there have been some attempts at making this uh, more tractable and nice. Uh, and I've been thinking about this for, for several years. I knew about this algorithm for, for well, at least since 2012 when I wrote my first paper about this. Uh, and then I just continuously kept thinking if you can do better than this. And, and then all this work finally paid off this year when uh, we finally managed to crack it uh, with my PhD student, Joan Bas Serrano and uh, my intern, Sebastian Curi, and his advisor, Andreas Krause, uh, in a paper that's shown in the next slide uh, that's called Logistic Q-Learning. 
So what uh, what uh, we finally man managed to do here is essentially come up with a tractable version of this reps algorithm. It is again inspired by the LP. It adds some more bells and whistles to it. For example, besides the uh, uh, one key component uh, that is being introduced here is the so-called Lagrangian decomposition of some of the variables. Uh, in the program, it essentially introduces a mirror variable u in this whole optimization process and then applies a different regularization function on it, also projects it to a different subspace. The details are not extremely important for this talk. You don't really need to understand it. It's just that really it is inspired and entirely derives from this LP formulation. And then, then in the dual, what we get is another two-step procedure in which we have to solve another convex optimization problem, unconstrained convex optimization problem to obtain an optimal parameter vector theta that is going to characterize our policy. And now we get uh, beautifully uh, uh, an explicit closed form policy update rule, uh, a recipe for the optimal policy that is now given in a fully tractable form. You can see that this is an exponential update to a policy pi zero. Well, you can half see it, that it's an exponential update to a policy pi zero with only theta star, only functions of theta star uh, appearing in the exponent. So there's no P in the exponent. We don't need to calculate any integral or an expectation in the exponent. So this really unifies the advantages of, uh, of, uh, of other deep RL methods that directly work with Q functions uh, and this reps method that uses a convex and nice and well-justified objective for policy evaluation. So, uh, so on the next slide, uh, I, I just praise a little bit more this, uh, this, uh, this objective function that this whole uh, procedure results in. So this is the convex optimization. This is the convex objective that we need to minimize for each policy update of QREPS, uh, which, is this, which is our version of the REPS algorithm. This is something that we call the logistic Bauman error. Uh, it does not suffer from any of the problems of the squared Bauman error that I described. It's a nice and convex function. It's a smooth function. It has bounded gradients in terms of the, the, the Q function. And, and also it is easy to estimate uh, directly based on samples. Uh, so if you, if you plot all these loss functions on the same slide, then you can really see the difference between them, right? So I'm, I'm showing this squared Bauman error, which as you can see is really non-convex. So there's no neural networks here. This is just uh, the squared Bauman error shown as a function directly of Q. You can see that it has kind of like weird bumps and humps and and uh, and these kind of like sharp notches. Uh, and you can you can patch it all you want. You can you know, truncate the gradients. You can use this Huber version of it. You can you're still going to have these problems uh, uh, that you're not getting if you're using the logistic Bauman error, which is like a nice and convex and smooth function as it is being shown here. So this is this is a very beautiful. Uh, uh, consequence that you can derive, a very beautiful algorithm that you can derive from linear programming. And I'm very excited about it. Okay, so on the next slide, I'm just flashing two uh, theorems, really just to illustrate that yes, we do indeed have very nice theory about this algorithm, theoretical results that are not possible for other deep RL methods uh, out there. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I really don't want to go into the details here. So, so on the next slide, I, I really just uh, show, you know, these things that uh, I guess most of you can interpret, you know, it's like curves that go up and our curves go uh, up faster than others. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so it works, it works amazingly well for some reason. We tried it in a bunch of, uh, bunch of actually really challenging, but small environments that are hard exploration games. And, uh, and in most of these environments, we beat the very, very strong contenders like the traditional deep Q learning method, DQN, proximal policy optimization, other versions of reps. So these are very popular deep reinforcement learning algorithms that are somehow struggling to, to work as well as, as this Q reps method. So, well, these are all relatively small problems, uh, but the results are very encouraging. We don't fully understand them. Maybe it's really because you just had to formulate the problem well in order to get uh, this kind of robust and nice performance. All right, so uh, I'm just going to say a few more, more words about other methods that you can derive from linear programs. My original aspiration for this talk would, would have been to give like a full tour of everything that is out there, but then, uh, I realized that due to the time constraints, I can only say a few words about these. So, so other LP-based methods uh, include primal dual methods that instead of looking, 
looking at either the primal or the dual LP, they look at an object in the middle that is called the Lagrangian uh, of the optimization problem, right? Which is like a, a single point optimization problem. You have uh, two sets of variables, mu and v, and you have to find a max min or a mix uh, or a min max point of this. So, so you just look at this Lagrangian and then, then you just run stochastic gradient descent in the primal and the dual variables. And this turns out to be like a very nice computational recipe as well that has been only explored in the last few years, right? So this is like a relatively obvious thing. If you work in constrained optimization, people thought about black box solvers. This one actually leads to very practical reinforcement learning algorithms as well. You can also, uh, you can also address uh, the problem of having too many variables and too many constraints by simply parametrizing the primal and the dual variables in linear form, for example. Uh, so, so these methods are really nice. They are implementable only with sample access to P. Uh, it can achieve state-of-the-art performance in small MVPs for finding near-optimal policies. Uh, and if the features are chosen well, then you can also have very, uh, very impressive empirical performance out of these methods as well. You can get very fast uh, convergence towards the optimal policy, even faster than traditional dynamic programming methods would. Uh, and another family of methods that is also derived from this primal dual perspective is, is a family of methods for, for off-policy learning. So in off-policy reinforcement learning, uh, you cannot really interact with the environment. You cannot draw actual uh, sample transitions from the transition function, but you have to work with, uh, with the pre-recorded set of transitions that were sampled from some occupancy measure mu zero. So this family of methods is based on just reparametrizing the primal variable, which was mu before. We just write this as xi, which is the likelihood ratio between mu and mu naught, the the optimization variable and the and the sampling distribution, and then run primal dual methods on this formulation. And turns out that this can really turn into efficient methods uh, that use offline policy data a lot more effectively. These are unbiased methods that do not actually require prior knowledge of mu zero. So on the next slide, I also just flash like a real quick learning curve here that shows that that, um, that uh, policy gradient methods that are using uh, estimators derived from this primal dual formulation uh, can have really excellent performance. Unbiased policy gradient estimates can be derived from there. Okay. Uh, so going forward, uh, I, I just really like to summarize uh, uh, all the content of this talk. I, I just really try to make a point that this LP formulation is really something to pay attention to. Uh, this has been ignored for many, many years. I think it was, it was ignored for due to like a wrong interpretation of those results. People really read these LP papers on a surface level and, and concluded that you need to solve these LPs via, uh, via black box methods. Turns out that it's a lot more effective if you take a closer look uh, and try to use this as a central part of our thinking. Uh, and of course, there are many, many open questions. I showed some theoretical results. Uh, I showed some empirical results, but there's still a long way to go to make them really competitive with everything that's out there in the literature. Uh, in particular, there is a uh, there has been so much engineering effort and then there has been so much brain power uh, assigned to analyzing methods derived from the Bauman equations. There are very sophisticated tools that are not yet available for these LP-based methods. Uh, and for this reason, I think that this is a great time to enter this research field because there's a lot of unexplored territory. There are a lot of open questions and a lot of wonderful opportunities to do impactful work in reinforcement learning. So I want to thank you for your attentions. Uh, and if you have any questions, please go ahead. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll first go uh, to address some of the questions that have been uh, raised in the chat, and then we'll go to the live audience. OK, so here are some questions from uh, the chat. <clears throat> so uh, there is a. It's more like a remark from Cristobal, who you know, um, who says that logistic Q learning is an unconstrained optimization problem. So okay. that's yeah, you, that's basically your nice breakthrough, thing. but it still requires computing expectations with respect to distributions that involve the environment. So is this a stochastic optimization problem? It is not clear because of the lock outside. 
Right, right, right. That is that is that is correct. Uh, so I mean, I'd rather not show the slides because that's a lot clunky. But uh, so it turns out that yes, you can indeed formulate this as a as a, as a stochastic optimization problem. And yes, indeed, uh, the expectation that is all the way within the nonlinear function is a bit of a problem. So it's not really possible to get unbiased estimates of the objective function and unbiased gradients of the objective function. Uh, but turns out that this uh, regularization parameter eta that was, uh, that was shown in the slides, this actually controls the estimation bias if we only use transition data. So we can really just replace all those expectations with just single trajectory sample data and then pick up a small bias in the process. The bias is controlled by the regularization parameter eta. So as eta gets small, we get a very small bias and we get very accurate updates. As long as this parameter is kept small, we are not going to blow up or, or do anything really, really terrible. So yes, it's, it's, it's really a great, great question. It's not a straightforward answer. Uh, it's, it's quite an advanced result to show that yes, indeed the bias can be controlled. And this is a unique feature of this loss function because the squared by one error that is commonly considered in the literature has the same problem, but it does not have a tuning parameter that makes it possible to control the bias. So it is absolutely impossible to get unbiased estimates of the squared Bellman error, whereas for this logistic Bellman error, you get this nice handle uh, on the bias. Okay, thank you. So a related question is like more generally, so at some point you said, that is actually something I was also wondering about. At some point you said you only, I mean, the big problem here is of course, there's not just the reward function, but there's the environment, which is a probability distribution, which you don't know. And yeah. sometimes you said, okay, this you can do if you only have knowledge about the, uh, basically you can find out by playing, I guess, by trying different actions and just making statistics. Yeah. You, can, the, you can learn all about Q you, you, you need to learn, but you suggested that sometimes you do know more because you said this one you can already implement if you can only uh, uh, just keep playing. So like in the general story about your, the, the various right. things you showed, like what exactly do you need to know about the environment? What do you have to learn uh, and in what way? Right, right. So, so, so I talked about a bunch of different methods. Uh, for example, this logistic curing method, as I said, it can, so the updates can be implemented by single trajectory data, right? So you only need to run your policy in the real environment and use that data to calculate your updates. But there are other families of methods that I described, like these primal dual methods that look at the Lagrangian and try to do primal dual gradient descent on that objective. So these methods, uh, I think the best ones uh, out there are still not able to use trajectory data. They need, uh, they need sampling access to the transition function, which means that, uh, that uh, you get to query samples for any state action pair X and A, right? Uh -huh. so even, even ones that are not directly accessible by your policy. Okay, so, so you cannot try that at home, I think. Definitely not, not <laughs> okay. yet. So that one, that one has still some ways to go. But, but, but for that particular setting, for this so-called generative model setting, this method is actually state of the art and beats all of the others in terms of guarantees. So this is a very promising aspect of them. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have a final question, what was actually asked very much in the beginning of the talk. So it's, it's more like the general question. MDP by Tom Verhoof. MDPs are often used to find decisions that maximize long-term reward. For many problems, it would be better to sacrifice some optimality uh, of reward to get lower variance. Would reinforcement learning also work to minimize variance? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then he says, because there are similar equations for variance. Yes, yes, that is right. That is right. So, so the objective that I was talking about was this was this linear objective, right? The expected reward, and there are many risk sensitive definitions of uh, of Markov decision processes as well, where what you worry about is not necessarily the expected reward, but like mean plus variance, for example, or 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 some moment generating function of of the reward function. So these are not directly uh, uh, embeddable in this in this LP formalism. But one thing that you can do, for example, is, uh, is minimize risk of the expected reward uh, instead of the expected reward itself. So there are convex risk measures that you, can, uh, that you can optimize, but I don't think that this LP formalism is really the right way to go about it. Maybe okay. It is. It's, 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 a, it's actually a very good question. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Tom says thank also, you. thank you. Um, yeah, like, uh, would like to give the opportunity to the floor uh, some additional questions. Yeah, sure. You mentioned uh, some applications of reinforcement 
reinforcement learning at the start. Uh, many of those have the property that the reward is only given at the final state, right? right. Like a mate in chess. Right. There's this concept of an occupancy uh, probability have any value in such situations? Uh, yes. So, so, in, so in that case, uh, well, I suppose, well, for example, think about the game of Go, right? Or like a game of chess, right? Where you only find out at the end whether you won or lost, right? So, uh, so of course, there are still like you know good trajectories that end up visiting the the, the bad final outcome, and and bad trajectories that end up visiting the good outcome. Uh, and so basically what you have to maximize in that case is the probability of arriving to that particular state. So you have to like maximize the occupancy of that particular state. But turns out that that, that occupancy, for example, like the probability of arriving to a winning state, that can be also written in terms of a linear set of constraints, right? So in terms of a flow constraint, you have to like find a path that ends up at the right spot. So this formulation definitely applies to such a well, so-called sparse reward problems or, or, or shortest path problems in which you have to find a goal state efficiently. So yes, this formalism definitely applies there. I would say that the methods that I was explaining uh, do not readily apply for this because if you have such sparse rewards, you need to find out of, of efficient ways of exploring your environment and searching through a large uh, uh, search space. And this one is really just turning things into an optimization problem and this is yeah, we, we, we yet have to add more efficient exploration methodology to these methods. But nevertheless, the formulation applies, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Unless there is a final urgent question, uh, I would suggest to thank the speaker again. Great. Thank you very much.